In the Buddhist tradition, particularly in Vajrayana, there is a, a, a kind of practice that is called devotional practice. And devotional practice has many components, uh, but one particularly meaningful and important component is that one develops a relationship of pure devotion with one's guru, with one's teacher. In the Vajrayana tradition, the teacher is considered to be like the door of liberation, because even though there has been a Buddha on the earth and there has been the Buddha's teaching, even though the teaching is written in the books, even though there are many ways in which you can approach the Buddha Dharma, it's really, according to Vajrayana t tradition, just about impossible to enter into the path, into the meat of the path, into the thick of the path, without the blessing of the teacher. The Lama is considered to be the blessing that is inherent in the path. The Lama is necessary for empowerment. The, the Lama is necessary for transmission. The Lama is necessary for uh, teaching. The Lama is necessary to make a bridge almost like the, the, the Lama is the, the nurse that administers the medicine. The doctor might prescribe it, the doctor might be considered the Buddha, but the Lama is considered to be the nurse that actually administers the medicine while we ourselves may be too weak or too unaware to be able to, to hold on to uh, the medicine or take it into our own mouths without some help. And in Vajrayana tradition, even from, from the very most preliminary practice to the very most superior practice, <clears throat> there is a devotional aspect to every practice that is done, and that is considered to be the vehicle or the means by which the blessing is actually transmitted. <clears throat> in preliminary practice, there is actually a section of devotional yoga, guru yoga, in which one practices, and this is something that is widespread, not only in our particular uh, uh, tradition, but is widespread across all the traditions in Vajrayana Buddhism, a uh, tradition of calling the Lama, of beseeching the Lama, of invoking the Lama's blessing. Now, in our particular Ngundro, we have a beautiful passage, a beautiful song of invocation. It's called La a Calling the Lama from Afar. It has a very haunting melody, and it's done with one's heart. And actually, the recommendation is that one should do that until tears arise in one's eyes. That one should, should do that in order to soften the ego, in order to soften the mind, and to make the mind like a bowl that is turned up, not turned over hard, you know, and, and unable to receive any blessing, but a bowl that is kept like this, that doesn't have any poison in the, or dirt in the bottom of it, that's kept purely so that when the nectar comes in it won't be mixed with poison or dirt and it isn't cracked uh, cracked through the um, <clears throat> distraction that we all fear, feel when we can't really keep our minds on any kind of devotional practice but our minds wander too much uh, that kind of bowl could not hold the blessing could not hold the nectar and of course if our minds are hard and filled with anger and hatred and that anger surfaces the bowl is turned over and the nectar simply runs off. So there's no blessing to be had. And we might fool ourselves thinking that we have a blessing, but in fact, no blessing has been received. So we practice this devotional yoga. And we practice it very sincerely. <clears throat> the um, benefit of this practice is immeasurable uh, in that it softens the mind. It's almost like if you think of planting a field of grain, you know, one has to plow the field then one has to harrow it or disc it, turn it over. Uh, one has to wait, you know, one has to soften it and, 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 and rake it and work the soil so that it's capable of receiving the seed. Otherwise, if the soil were not ready, the seed would be thrown out and it would just bounce like on a hard surface. It would not do much good. Any of you that have planted things know the truth of that. So devotional yoga is a cultivator. It's considered to make one ready. Without devotional yoga, there's no, there is no possibility, really, of the blessing being fully received. The devotional yoga is meant to benefit the student. It never benefits the teacher. If the teacher needs devotional yoga, the teacher is inadequate and impure. The teacher is without value. So the, the devotional yoga is purely for the benefit of the student. The teacher is not pleased by the devotional yoga. The teacher is pleased by the movement and the softening and the gentling 
and the change that occurs within the student, but that's because the teacher wishes to benefit the student. It isn't because the teacher requires any kind of devotional yoga or any kind of um, notice, really, at all. So in our tradition, in preliminary practice, we practice this calling the Lama from afar, and it's a haunting practice. It, it will bring tears to one's eyes if one were to practice it with a full heart and really do one's best. And when that begins to happen, there is a change in the student. There is truly a change. Often that is when the Lama, the, Lama, the teacher, first begins to notice the student. That is when the, the Lama takes, a, and takes, a, 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 takes an awareness of the student. That is when the student comes into the Lama's mind and the Lama into the student's mind. That is when this tremendous bridge, this perfect bridge, is formed. That is, that is everything, really everything on the path, without which there is only dressing up in Dharma clothing like a peacock, you know, there is nothing. Uh, without that. So that is necessary. Perhaps today we're going to talk about that, but maybe we'll talk about that with a little twist. Maybe we'll talk about calling the student from afar. In the same way as we call the Lama from afar, in traditional practice through the invocation, uh, through this, this, this haunting practice of putting one's heart in a, in a position of surrender. Maybe now we can talk about what the Lama experiences when the Lama calls the student from afar. And maybe we can talk about the student's response to that. And maybe somewhere in that you might find yourself and your own reaction, your own habit patterns. And through recognizing that, there might be some benefit. When a student calls the teacher in their mind, when they begin to make their mind and their heart like a bowl, there are several different things that are happening. First of all, there is some fantastic auspicious karma that is ripening. In order for a student to even make that step, the student must have accumulated a tremendous amount of merit, a virtue somewhere in the past. A non-virtuous mind cannot call the teacher with devotion. It cannot happen. Uh, they, they will not be able to experience that devotion, that gentling, that softening. So. The student must know that about themselves, that if they are responding with devotion, if they are really calling the Lama, if they are really experiencing surrender, then there's some virtue in the student's mind. And the student should be happy and pleased with that. When the student calls the Lama, when the student practices that kind of devotion, it's because the student has realized certain things. And the only way that real devotion can be practiced is if these things have been realized. First of all, the student has looked around and has seen that cyclic existence or ordinary life is flawed. It is faulted. The student has looked around, and sometimes it's the older students that really, in some ways, unfortunately, are able to do this because they've seen their lives pass. And, and they look around and they say, what have I done? I've worked so hard for maybe 55, 60 years. I've worked so hard. And what have I really accomplished? What am I going to take with me? What is this that I've done? What has happened when this time has passed? And so sometimes older students are truly prepared to understand the faults of cyclic existence. Younger students have a much more difficult time with that because younger students are still trucking along, you know, they're still thinking, oh yeah, I can do this and I can do this and we're still steamed up, puffed up with that I can, I can do kind of thing. Too many exciting threads to pull, too many different ways to move. We have, our juices are flowing and we're, we're, we're moving ahead and it's, it's, it hooks us. It hooks us into this delusion. But at any rate, the student that is prepared to call the teacher has been awakened, stimulated, has understood that so much time has passed and what has happened during that time? Not much, not much that we can really account for. We've had some fun, we've had some big fun, some of us and we've had some big suffering, and we've had some big excitement, we've had some big letdown, 
and it's up and down and up and down and we've all experienced old age we're all I mean we're all going to experience old age if we live that long we're all going to experience death and we've all experienced sickness and it just goes round and round and round doesn't it and at some point we look at that and we see it and we ask ourselves isn't there something more isn't there something there must be something we begin to move in that direction and then we see someone who can give us a path not only just thoughts about the path not only just ideas that are popular in the new age not just some theories but a technology a method a method that is succinct and exacting and has proven to give itself to, to show has shown itself rather to give results that have been repeated and proven over time <coughs> So this, <coughs> this student looks at that and thinks, wow, this is something. And the student finds themselves sort of like in the position of experiencing themselves in a burning house and suddenly they've seen a door. They've seen a way out. They've seen something that doesn't have the danger in it that cyclic existence has, that doesn't have the, the fault in it that cyclic existence has. Maybe there's a way out. Maybe there's something that we can do. And the student looks at that and says, Oh, and they gather themselves together and they're, they're, they're hopeful and they're joyous and they, something's going on. Suddenly they're excited. And then the student begins to want to call that, to bring that closer to them. And that's a beautiful, precious, and exciting moment. But that moment can only happen due to the virtue of the student's previous practice. That really only happens due to virtue. So the student begins to call the teacher. And the student has lots of different experiences while that happens. Uh, sometimes the student doesn't know how to measure what the relationship with the teacher is. Sometimes there's some initial confusion. There are all sorts of interesting and different things that happen during that time. But still, the student with the kind of virtue that is necessary to really do this will remain firm, will continue, will move forward, and continue to call the teacher continue to invoke that presence in their lives and really come to the point due to the virtue of their practice where they will do anything. They will do anything because they know their time is short. They know that they've tried everything and nothing's worked so far. Nothing has produced permanent happiness. So they are looking at the door to liberation and in this path that's how the teacher is considered teacher is considered to be the very door of liberation. They are looking to walk through, just as they want to exit that burning house, they want to walk through that door. And it's a really amazing thing. But what is it that the teacher experiences as the teacher begins to call the student? <clears throat> in the Vajrayana tradition, we are taught that when a tulku appears in the world, a tulku is considered to be like an emanation of Lord Buddha or Guru Rinpoche's enlightened compassion. That the, the, the teacher is considered to be an extension of that. Guru Rinpoche himself said, I will appear in the world as your root teacher. The root teacher is defined as the one with whom you have such a relationship that upon meeting this teacher, upon hearing this teacher, you have immediately understood, or perhaps over time, understood something of the nature of your mind. You have seen something, you have recognized something, and you have come to understood. Perhaps it is through some words that the teacher has given you. Perhaps it is simply through being with the teacher. Perhaps it is uh, through some experiences that you've had while you are with the teacher. But you have come to understand something of your own mind. You have come in some small way to see your face that may not necessarily be pleasant at first, you see. Uh, you think that that should be a beautific experience and you're waiting for the hallelujah chorus. That may not be the way it happens to you. It may be painful at first. You may realize how puffed up you are at first. You may realize how vapid your life has been thus far. That's painful. That's of all realizations, that's the most painful. And, and you may take account of yourself and you may not, the account may not be so good. 
and, and, and suddenly, suddenly you have this urge and this yearning. That's your face. That's your face just as surely as if you had been struck enlightened immediately upon seeing your teacher. That is your face. That face that turns you around and moves you. That's your face too. So when you meet your root teacher, that, that relationship becomes so fantastic, so wonderful. And that is the display of Guru Rinpoche's touch. That is how Guru Rinpoche has appeared in your life. You cannot doubt that. That is how the Buddha has appeared to you. Because that is the beginning. That is the face. That is the movement. That is the method of enlightened awareness. That is the beginning of the awakening. So that must be the Buddha. That must be the Buddha appearing in your mind. When the teacher begins to call the student, the teacher actually appears in the world, and generally if the teacher is a bodhisattva, and hopefully the teacher is a bodhisattva, because if the teacher is not a bodhisattva, you might as well throw that one out the window. You have made another mistake. <laughs> You don't want to go to school and learn from like Betty Cracker or something like that. You, know. you really want to know that you are teaching someone who's equipped to give you the method, to give you the path. So if the teacher is a bodhisattva, if the teacher is uh, an incarnation who has achieved some realization and therefore has returned solely to benefit beings, there is some design, in, and different tukus will appear in different ways, but there is some design in the tulku's method, the, uh, the tulku will, will have a sense of, of, um, of purpose, from a very young age, a sense of purpose. Um, and, and it will be uh, the cornerstone of that tulku's life. That will be, everything will be built around that. It's almost like everything that arises, all of the circumstances that arise in the, in the bodhisattva's life, in the tulku's life, will, um, will arise from that intention. Everything is centered on that intention. That intention is the center, almost like if you're building a house and if there's one post that holds up the whole house somewhere in the middle, although I don't think houses are really built like that, and I'm sure the carpenters are getting angry at me just for saying that. Uh, but anyway, the cornerstone, if you will, of the, of the structure is the, the, the tulkus, the bodhisattva's pure intention, the intention to be of some benefit. So the things that hold it up, that's, that's what it is that compassion, that loving kindness. As the, the, the tulku moves toward their time, and that happens differently with each one, there is a sense of calling the students. The tulku will, will call the students. Now, sometimes I, I can say to you from, from what I've heard and from what I know, it isn't really like uh, the, the teacher will um, know the name of a certain student and just be, you know, necessarily finding that student, you know, going to that student's house and knocking on the door and saying, hey, guess what? I'm your teacher. <laughs> because uh, terrible things would probably happen if teachers did things that way. And it just isn't the way that it's done. It's not what really happens. <clears throat> what begins to happen is that there is there is a quality of intention, of, of loving kindness, of compassion that begins to ripen in the teacher's mind. And it's almost like it sets up a vibrational quality, almost like a sound, almost like a sound. In a, a, a song, maybe. A sound, a note that begins to sound in a certain way. Because the way and it's not accidental that certain students appear at that time simply because the karma of the situation is such that the teacher who appears in the world having a certain relationship with certain students and that's already established because the karma is already such the karma is already established that karma will begin to actualize itself in that the the teacher will, will set up a quality, a vibrational field or a sound or something that will be appropriate, that will reach out and touch certain particular students and their minds will respond to it. Their minds will respond to it and they will be called. 
students will appear from literally nowhere. <clears throat> I don't consider myself a great teacher in any regard. I consider myself the humblest of the humble, believe me. Uh, I do consider myself thus, but I know my own small experience has been just that. I never, until Penner and Pache recognized me, I never represented myself in any way. I never hung out a shingle and said, this or that is what I am or who I am. Never did that happen. But students came when I became ready. And I know that this happens with other teachers. There, there, is, there is a vibration that goes out. There is a sound that goes out that has, it's like a hook. It's a hook. And, you know, just as Velcro doesn't, one piece of Velcro doesn't attach itself to a smooth surface, if the student doesn't have the responding piece in them, it won't connect, you see? It will just smooth right over. You see what I'm saying? It'll just slick right over. But if the student has that other piece, they'll be tight. You can't separate them. It's just, to separate them literally sounds like Velcro. It sounds like your heart is being taught out, you know, torn out. It, there's something there that is so fantastic. It cannot be explained in ordinary terms. And so this amazing, fantastic thing happens. So from the Lama's point of view, there is simply the display of that intention. That's all that happens. And the student from literally nowhere, the student could be a coarse and crude construction worker. You know, the student could be a ballerina. You know, the student could be a disco dancer. One of my nuns is a former disco dancer. <laughs> oh, Mark. Of course, that was Mark. He's, he's one of my nuns. Who was <laughs> they could be drummers. They could be all sorts of weird things. You never know. And suddenly, something begins to happen. And they don't really change from being weird things. They just show up. <laughs> hey, you set yourself up for that. <laughs> Two weird things are discussing this in the corner. <clears throat> so, this this amazing thing happens, and this 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 response begins to happen. Where does how do they? And often the student will come up and they go, "What am I doing here? How did I get in this? Uh, how, what is this?" Uh, you know, I, I had one student that uh, I remember the first time she came to me for a consultation. She was so prim and proper. She wore this little proper camel suit, you know, and she was very businessy and very. Here I am, very businessy, very professional sort of woman. She comes in, click, 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 little high heels, sits down and goes, well, I'd like to have a reading. So we, we talk and we talk and we talk, and pretty soon, about three or four hours later, she's like. <laughs> and in tears, and it's like she feels like her life has just fallen apart, and she's just en you know, left one train and entered onto another. And all these weird things begin to happen to her, and she's crying, and she doesn't know what's happening to her, and she feels like she's going crazy. She, she, she just doesn't know what this is. And really, all that is, there's, there's, no, there's no monkey business happening on the part of the teacher. The teacher isn't saying, hey, let me see how I can mess up this person. <laughs> you know? It isn't like that at all. There is simply this, this call, this, this sound that is going out, and the student if the hook is there, suddenly it becomes Velcroed, literally Velcroed. And they can't, and suddenly, and sometimes there is an anger that happens at first because you didn't want to be Velcroed, you know? You didn't, you didn't ask for this. <laughs> you know, you thought you wanted to be free and independent. You know, you don't want to be stuck to something. And, and suddenly you can't get away. You're hooked. You're hooked. Well, the hook doesn't happen because the teacher is manipulative. The hook happens because you have seen your face. And the karma in your mind is such that you have responded in a way that you never could have predicted. The student might be a very conventional, not ever been religious before in their life. The student might be very unconventional and never thought they would deal with a conventional religion like Buddhism. And they might be really ticked off about it. They just didn't want any of these things to happen and suddenly, <laughs> hooked. 
and the student can sometimes respond with anger, literally. And then sometimes the student can feel like they're too young to die. How did this happen? Suddenly I'm surrendering, and I didn't want to surrender. I wanted to have more fun. I wanted to rock and roll. I wanted to continue to be a free agent and have all these exploring, you know. I wanted to be footloose and fancy tree, free. Let me go where I want to go and do what I want to do. Don't chain me down. Oh, yeah. And they're singing all these songs. And <laughs> some, <laughs> suddenly they got lead feet. They can't move. They just can't go. They're incapable of movement. What are they going to do? They... they and they grieve. They start to grieve. They grieve like someone died. And sometimes the students have to go through a period of time where they must be permitted to grieve. Can't rush them. They have to grieve. Something died. Yes, something died. The part of their life when they were not hooked just died. And they can hear that Velcro, you know. <laughs> and it can be a really uncomfortable position to be in. And sometimes they feel all kinds of different responses that are just unbelievable. I mean, it's unbelievable to watch some of the responses that student ha students have when they first meet their root guru and feel that feeling, that response. It's just amazing. Sometimes the student will wonder what kind of demon they have turned into. I used to think I was a good spiritual person, and suddenly I'm acting like a complete turkey. And it, and it often happens because the student has simply met their guru and they are responding to this feeling that they've never known before in their lives in a very human way. But the teacher continues in what seems to the student like a relentless way to send out this call, this call, this call. You can't resist something that is like your mind and the teacher is set up due to their compassionate intention, karmically set up, really without any choice, to sound like and to respond to the student's mind. The teacher will be like them, vibrationally, sometimes like them situationally. Sometimes the student can look at the teacher and see themselves quite clearly. Sometimes they can simply hear the words, and it's so much like the way they are. So funny, so strange. And that's really all you're seeing when you see that is you're seeing compassion. That's all that is to be understood. You, know, you should never think that you're understanding about the teacher by determining how much the teacher is like you. All you're understanding is yourself. The teacher is only acting from the point of view of compassion. That is to say, if it's a qualified and, and, and realized teacher, if it is uh, someone who is you know, uh, considered to be a bodhisattva or an incarnation, a toku. Then what you're seeing really is the display of compassion and what you're seeing is your own face. If anger comes up, that's your face too. That's what you're seeing. If resentment comes up, that's what you're seeing too. Sometimes resentment comes up and that's, that's the hardest one because the student will think, they're kind of spiritual, you know? They almost think of themselves as kind of a little guru, you know? <laughs> like a junior guru. You know, I have some answers and I've got some methods and yes, I have some worldly wisdom here and I'm sort of slick in my own way. And I'm king or queen of my little mountain. Of course, my mountain's about that high and I'm very, very, very small. But uh, suddenly I move into a bigger place and there's another king or queen. And uh, there's a guru that is... You have to face it, far superior. And so you look at that and you feel kind of resentful because you've been dethroned. That's painful. That can be really painful. And first, what might come up is a kind of resentment. A resentment also that the different situations that you've engaged in during your life were not the holy, far-flung, high, amazing things that you thought that they were. And it took the superior teacher to, sh to show you that. And there might be some resentment there. But all that is happening, can you really understand this? Can you really hear this? All that is happening is that there is a sound that's being sounded. That on some level you are capable of hearing due to the karma of your mind. What is happening is happening because of you, not because of anyone else. This is your mind. This is your karma. This is your face that you are seeing. 
Your response is your own response. When the student first responds, is generally there, is, there are obstacles that come up. Sometimes, and this is odd, when the student first finds the path, they'll be sick at first, physically sick. They'll suddenly come down with everything you can possibly imagine. They'll have the virus, they'll have the flu, they'll get ingrown toenails, you know, I mean, all kinds of amazing weird things, well, and sometimes worse, sometimes worse. But hopefully if they can really work on the devotion and really solve that problem, really purify the connection between themselves and the teacher, whatever obstacle arises will ripen benignly, but it depends on how they can purify, really, that obstacle through practicing pure devotion and through practicing purely just in general, in compassion and in and, and that method. Um, if they can really get with the program and get with it purely, often even the worst obst obstacles will ripen benignly, including things like brain tumors and, and then lesser things, uh, that uh, chronic illness of some kind. Sometimes they will actually ripen benignly, meaning that they will either go away or be not a burden, not a problem. When the student begins to respond in, in a different way, sometimes with anger, they must understand that suddenly this piece of anger and hatred that didn't come from somewhere else, where did it come from? Didn't it come from the student's mind? Wasn't it within them? Could they be feeling, if it, feeling it if it weren't within them? I mean, who's running the show anyway? If the student feels anger, if the student feels anger, hatred, it must have been in their minds. So perhaps what happens is that there is a, that obstacle of hatred, that actual obstacle, ripens and it comes to the surface, kind of like a bubble coming to the surface of a pond. Now you have the opportunity to live and breathe and and, and hold on to that stink, you know, of, of hatred. Or you have the opportunity through your practice, through practicing the antidote, which is pure devotion, which is compassion, which is pure mindfulness. You have the opportunity to let the bubble do what bubbles do. Come to the surface of the lake and simply pop. Simply pop. What is a bubble once it is popped? Gone gone. And the first breath of kindness and devotion can surely blow it away. The student always has that obstacle, but instead what the student generally does, the student says, I'm right here. I have a reason to be angry. I have a reason to be resentful. Let's see. Let me find the reasons. Um, um, and then you'll find them. Of course you'll find them. You're going to make them up if you don't find them. You're going to pretend them. You're going to take little signs and you're going to write your own script. If you are intent on finding reasons for justifying your ha hatred and your anger, we're all champs at that. We're so good at that. We're like the Steven Spielbergs of samsara. We can make a movie you wouldn't believe. So that will happen. But if instead you realize that what is coming to the surface is an obstacle to your practice, that it is no more power than you give it, that you are capable of simply letting go, of surrendering, of practicing devotion, of using the method in order to overcome the obstacle. You know, it's almost like I want to say to the students sometime, if they're if they're men, and even if they're women, it seems like the only appropriate phrase, I want to say, are you man enough to do this? Can you stand outside of yourself and really look at it? Can you see that this is the phenomena of your mind and just blow it off? Can you do that? Are you man enough? Are you human enough? Are you strong enough? And sometimes we're not, are we? We sort of wimp out. And we want to be right. We want to have an issue. We want to be safe without changing. We don't want to change. So difficult to do. And meanwhile, all the teacher is really doing 
is calling the student from afar, sounding that note that is so like the student's mind, and it begins to bring forth this response that is in the student's mind. And what they see is their own face, layer upon layer of their own face. Ultimately, if they practice devotion, they will see their true face, which is their nature. Now they're only seeing the dust that is covering it. Now they're only seeing the stuff on top of it. But all the teacher really does is sound the sound of their nature. And something begins to happen. That sound is some kind of thing that's like you can't even hear it with your own ears, you know? You can't even hear it. But it's so powerful, it can change the life of a student like that. Like instantly. And it can sustain that change. And it's also so powerful that it can change an entire area. It can change a community. It can change the world. But it's so subtle that you probably couldn't even hear it with your own ears. What is that? It is the greatest and the most gossamer force that there is, and that is the force of compassion, the bodhicitta. In practice, the bodhicitta is compassion, it is kindness as we understand it. But its ultimate nature, the bodhicitta, is the ultimate truth. It is the ultimate Buddha nature. And that is the sound that is being sounded. Vibrationally cloaked to suit the students for whom the teacher has appeared. And it is for those students that, to te that the teacher has returned, that the teacher has appeared. So it is like you. It is like you. And you should be strong. You should take responsibility for what comes up in your mind. You should know that this is your time. And you should respond through practice, not through agreeing with yourself and saying, it's okay to do this. It's okay to have this hatred. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be vengeful. It's okay to be resentful. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to whatever. It's... Why is that okay? when you could be moving closer to your greatest hope. So each student must have strength and understand what is happening to them. Do you, you who are responding, do you know what is happening to you? Do you really understand it? Do you really see its importance? And when the stuff comes up that comes up, and I know it comes up, the discursive thought, you know, the the anger, the disagreement, the, well, I don't know if I agree with that, you know, all these different kinds of thoughts. When that comes up in your mind, do you have the courage to get a hold of yourself, to take a hold of yourself and understand what is happening to you, that you are in fact seeing your own face? This is your resentment. This is your anger. This is your sadness. This is your needing to be independent. These are your these are reflections, these are images of your mind. And in truth, so long as they keep you from pure practice and perfect surrender, from truly seeing, with the help of your teacher, your own primordial face, these, in fact, are only obstacles to your practice that are coming up. And this is the form that they are coming up in. So you can begin by giving thanks that they come forth in such an easy-to-deal-with way. I mean, you could have met your teacher and then gotten run over by a truck. That could have happened. That could have been a big obstacle. <laughs> well, that was nice. <coughs> but it didn't happen. You're still here. And you can, right now, begin to develop the courage to move forward without any hesitation. Students respond as they do with hope and fear, and sometimes there's a lot of fear, isn't there? Hope and fear with anger, with, re with restraint, with judgment, with discursive thought. They respond that way 
because it is their nature to do so. That is the nature of samsara, that is the nature of cyclic existence, and that is the nature of all sentient beings. We have developed this habitual tendency of response in that way. Why should we suddenly change? Of course we're still responding that way. We always do. Always. But the difference is, the important difference is, that suddenly now we have a choice. And we can begin. We can respond through mindfulness. We can respond through practice. We can respond by recognizing through courage that this is our response due to our habitual nature. We can stand outside of that whole deeply re reactive scenario and instead of reacting with the hatred, instead of reacting with the grief, instead of reacting at all, we can know, we can understand. This is my mind. That is my teacher. The only thing to do is to walk forward and to continue to walk through the door, so simple, and yet due to our strong reactions, so difficult. So remember when you are angry at your teacher, which really is useless to be, when you are resentful, when you are anxious, when you are going through all the gamut of human experience, which you do, when you do everything from want to belt your teacher right in the snoot to falling desperately in love with your teacher, when any of those things happen, remember that this is a reflection of your mind. This is your nature. This is, this is your habitual tendency, rather. And that as you go deeper in your practice with your teacher, you will eventually also see your nature in the way that you did see your habitual tendency. You will also see your nature. Stand outside of that reaction. It is only that. It has no real importance. It's not a big deal. Don't make a big deal out of it. Don't blame yourself. Don't make yourself right. It's neither one. It's just a reaction. They come and they go. No big deal. Just walk through the door of liberation. That is all your teacher wishes you to do. That is all the guru really wishes you to do. Just walk. That's all. Just move forward. I'm reminded again and again of that wonderful story uh, that we hear in our tradition of, of the father who had many children in a house, and children that he loved very, very dearly. And the father came home to his house, and he saw that his children were playing in the house, but that the house was on fire. And so he called out to his children. He said, come out, come out quickly. The house is on fire. And he couldn't really get in to help them. So it, He's calling, Get, come, come, please come, come out quickly. And the, te the children were playing. They were happy playing. You know how children are. You know how children are. They were happy playing, and they were busy being very important in their house. Very, very important in their house. So they're busy in their house playing important games. Aren't we all playing important games? They're very important games. So we're playing important games in our house, and those children are in there, and they're playing, and they're intent. They're concentrating. Aren't we concentrating on our lives? We're so concentrated. We concentrate so hard, and so the children are playing, and no matter how hard the father calls and how loud, the children cannot come out. They cannot hear. They can't get themselves together. Have you ever seen children, how they do that? They just can't pull themselves away. Have you ever noticed how children do that? Big children, too. So anyway, and that's happening and happening, and suddenly the, the father thinks, how can I, he's crying, how can I get my students out? So he sounds the sound that the children need to hear. He said, I have chariots for you. I have umbrellas for you. I have big elephants to pull you. I have toys for you to play with. I have everything you need out here. Come, come. And seductively, the teacher calls the student, uh, this father calls the children. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Freud, your slip is showing. The father calls the, stu the children. So the father's calling the children, and suddenly the children go, toys, toys, umbrellas, elephants, chariots. Yeah, that's what I want. And then they come out, and, they, and the father says, Really, I don't have anything for you. It's just that the house was on fire, and I had to get you out. But I have for you something precious. I have for you your freedom. Now you're free, and you can live. And you weren't consumed. You weren't consumed and helpless by yourself. 
So the story is kind of like that. I'm paraphrasing it, but it's kind of like that. And it really is the story of the teacher and the student, isn't it? It really is the story of the teacher and the student. All that is done is that the student is being called. Everything else that happens, happens in your mind. All you are truly seeing when you meet your root guru is the compassionate extension of the Buddha's miraculous activity. The rest is up to you. Just like your practice, how much you do, how little you do, how honest you are, how real you are, how well you apply yourself, it's really up to you. In this path, literally, the ball is in your court. You can do anything. You can achieve enlightenment. And you can also do absolutely nothing while you're working real hard looking like you are. Think about that. And have courage. Have the courage to really walk through the door. That is all anybody asks of you. Nanda. Nanda.